All right. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone, wherever you are hailing from. Welcome to the Red Hat OpenShift Twitch. Uh, I am very, very, very excited to be joined by uh, not just uh, John Willis, the person, but John Willis, the friend, John Willis, the mentor, and John Willis, uh, the guy I used to work with, and now we're, we're coworkers again. So, uh, you know, I'm a technical marketing manager here at Red Hat, and I will let John introduce himself. Hey, Chris, it's great. You know, I, I think you were talking about my, you know, my kids are always talking about Twitch, and I really didn't fully understand what it was, but now I could at least go bra back and brag to them and say, hey, I've been on Twitch, guys. You've been on Twitch. That's yeah, right. You go. <laughs> You've got your own thing. Get my, uh, my Twitch badges with my youngins. Um, yeah, no, uh, you know, my name's John Willis. I go by the handle of Botsugaloop on Twitter. Um, I've been doing this mucky stuff that we call IT, specifically around operations for 40 years. Uh, I'm pretty old. Um, but I, I would say the <laughs> last 10 years, I've been very focused on maybe 15 years on on really the what, what we've been calling sort of the, the precursor to DevOps, DevOps cloud, distributed computing, if you will. And that's, you know, I won't give you my boring history prior to that, but mainframes and all sorts of crazy stuff. But, you know, about somewhere less than 15 years ago, I um, got involved in open source projects that related to systems management, you know, uh, you know, some of the um, original open source tooling. I got into infrastructure as code stuff, um, CF Engine, Puppet, Chef, ran that mild cloud. Um, and then, um, yeah, just been deeply involved. I've built, I mean, I've been done startups my whole life. Um, mostly failed miserable failures i mean like, like the, most startups yeah, yeah <laughs> crushing, you know, that, if they talk about the whatever doesn't kill you make you stronger like that's me for startups but <laughs> but the last five years or six years have been really good to me i i sold the company to dell i sold the company to docker and um and so anyway just long story short last october a good friend of mine another devops luminary if you will andrew clay schaefer said, hey, what would you think about coming with me over the Red Hat? And I got to be perfectly honest with you. I was like, Andrew, did you butt dial the wrong person? Because <laughs> you know me, right? I'm a startup. No, yeah, you're, you're a startup, like small, big companies yeah, and, small company kind of guy. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Oh, you know, okay, Andrew, like if it was anybody other than you, like we wouldn't have this conversation. But um, And then he said he was forming a group with Kevin Bear, and I've known Kevin forever, and he's – He's, you know, he's an amazing person. He's co-author of the Phoenix Project. Yeah. And, uh, James Smart guy. and, and we, uh, you know, we, I, I, you know, I got, I mean, Jim, you know, I, you know, and, uh, you know, like Jim, my buddy, you know, I, I met him three times, but, but, you know, it was Andrew was like, you know, let me show you how serious I am and Red Hat is about this. Would you want to get on a call with Jim Weiner or stuff? Like, you know, well, okay, that's pretty serious. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And this was, for frame of reference, because Jim is president at IBM oh, now, sorry, this was yeah. back, what, October? Yeah, August? it was October, yeah. It was actually yeah, October September, last year. the conversation, we started in October. And and um and I fell in love and I had read Open Org and you know I knew I knew his backstory because I know I'm also a, a, like a, you know like you know I have this so my day job and then there's my family and then there's mm -hmm. like three jobs I do till about <laughs> two in the morning and and a geek about aviation and Delta and all that stuff has always been really yeah good. yeah so, so same so same he, kind of thing yeah yeah his background was just fascinating to me and then mm -hmm. they get to meet him in person was just so. Uh, and I was telling somebody just the other day that he's the real deal, you know, like there's, yeah, he, there's nothing. If you see him on a, on a sort of promo where he's taking a call, an incident call, right? he's taking an incident call. I mean, I, 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 I fell in love with him and, and you know, so yeah. the, the stars aligned and we, we were brought in as this uh, global transformation office mm -hmm. and uh, you know, we're, we're trying to find our way and see if we can't help. You know, one of the things that we talked about is, you know, we've done a great job in DevOps, right? Like 10 years, 2020, yeah. we'll all pat ourselves on the back. We've been, a, it's a, you know, it's a solar giants. It's a collective, you know, people say, I'm, you know, John's one of the founders of DevOps. Yeah. Well, I was there Yeah. very early. I was the only American in, in the original conversation, but like, don't ever let anybody imply that it wasn't thousands and thousands of people exactly who helped build this. Uh, but, but here's the thing in 2020, Okay, we've done good, right? Like, like everybody, take a moment, 
pat yourself Take a deep breath. On the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but you know, like and and again, no disrespect to sort. I use this as an example because I do think GitOps and uh, are great things. But in five years from now, if we're still just CI/CD and GitOps, then we failed. Yes. So this time in 2020, and this is what GTO Global Trend is all about, is in 2020, let's think about the story for the next 10 years. And, uh, and that's what we've been trying to do, and we're trying to meld the ideas of the existing Red Hat. And, you know, you know me, and I, you know, getting to work with you is always a blast. We got to do some really interesting projects together. And, uh, yeah. you know, your ace is in my book, bud. So, uh, well, thank yeah. you, sir. I appreciate yeah. that. Now, just to give everybody context, John and I worked for a startup together, what, two or three years ago now? It was a I while was, ago. I was uh, down on years, man. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, we, we worked together on some projects. John was actually my boss for a while, and oh. uh, it was it was a lot of fun. Oh, let me give you a heads up, right? Like, one thing I, I'll, tell, you know, I'll go in and like, you know, again, I, I don't know how, like, I guess we don't have to be politically correct per se, but like, it kills we have to be me nice like, to our competitors and everything else. But yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. But, but, but what I saw, like one of the things is that like I go in environments and I see what they pay for Splunk, right? And I'm like, ah. And you yeah. know, me and you, but you did the heavy lifting. You replaced Splunk in a lot in, in like a top ten bank with uh, yeah. with Elk. I mean, that's that's a pretty impressive resume thing, you know. Like the idea was the the guy who championed it, you know, was I was mm -hmm. able to get the deal in, but. You know, we put you in there, and like you, not you banged it out, and, and that bank today has basically taken Splunk off the balance sheet. Yeah, no, that they're they're saving a ton of money now, and it it was just you know, I, having grown up in you know North Carolina and spent so much time working with Linux and being in Raleigh at the time, you know, when when we were working together. Well, actually, no, I was up here, but you know, having spent so much time around Red Hat and it being just kind of a Red Hat company, uh, walking in the door, it was kind of like. All right, this is what you want to do. Well, here, you know, move the objects out of my way first, and we can get it done. So, yeah, uh, it was funny. One of the first projects that I worked on there to give you an idea of how like far behind they were in their DevOps journey. Like they they had a it was a remote position, and you know, I'd come on site every you know few weeks or so. But they literally had a problem confirming whether or not the VMs they got from ops were of the size they requested, right? Mm -hmm. Like, keep in mind, this is put in via a ticket. And the first piece of code they wanted me to write was an actual Ansible playbook that they could run to verify that the system meets the requirements of the environment it's about to go in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that tells you how, like, back off the DevOps scale they were, right? Like, they didn't, not only did it take weeks to order VMs, but they would come in and be the wrong size or the wrong specs or whatever. And yeah, like having to go through that, I think was very eye opening for me from a DevOps perspective, having gone through so many companies where like that was just table stakes, right? right? Like if, if you wanted a VM, you just got it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, there's not, that, that we do want to talk about automatic governance, but not to take too much so spin, you know, as I go in and I do these sort of organizational forensics or what I did with Criminal Red Hat. And you just interview thousands and thousands of people, not thousands, hundreds and hundreds of people, 400, 500 people. But um, it's that trust thing, right? Like, yeah, I can see mm -hmm. why somebody would want that. It's not just that they made a mistake. It's, you know, it's the, you know, infrastructure doesn't trust the developers. Right. So there's, I, I'd there's go a to wall. There's a legit wall. <laughs> yeah. The developers would say, you know, yeah, we always have a problem. You know, like, I don't know why, like if we ask for a, you know, 16 gig, or we ask for this amount of disk space, like, mm -hmm. can they just trust that we're running a billion dollar revenue service? And and then you go to the infrastructure and people are like, we can't trust them. You know, we right. have to cut all their requests in half. Like, yeah. wait a minute, they support a service that brings in a billion dollars worth of revenue a year. Like, and, anyway, and, yeah. And yeah, yeah. No, that's a, that's a very much a common, uh, like, DevOps problem is... There's an ins like an edict on one side uh, against uh, the other kind of deal, and it's it's sad but true. So, yeah. so cool, man. You want to talk about automated governance? I hear. Yeah, you know, uh, it's been uh, you know, you know that um, you know. So, I, my career has been sort of finding new areas that you know I'm not the first in, you know, um, but you know, it, it's like you know, I, I think somebody way back had this analogy about. When they uh, go, they only go to countries where this this may not make sense now, where where at least they have one McDonald's in the country, right? Mm. Uh, 
you know, like, right. Like they're not fully developed, uh, but they, but yeah, but But they have some infrastructure. That's right. So I'm really good at sort of finding the people who are, are working on something that that very, very few people are sort of aware of. And, um, and then it just really, you know, if it hits sort of, it, it it sort of mind melds with me. So, you know, I, I did that with, with, with chef, you know, I I came Mm -hmm. in very early at chef and like, I fell in love with chef. You know DevOps, of course, and you know cloud, of course, and then. Um, but about three or four years ago, uh, Shannon Leitz over at Intuit, she defined this thing called DevSecOps. Mm-hmm. First, I really didn't went crazy about the sort of morphing of the DevOps, thing. <laughs> but I, I got to know Shannon, and she's incredible. And and you know, like you start forgetting like who cares about the name. So I got I I, I dove all in on on Dev you know DevSecOps right in. And, and I, you know, I've been sort of working through a lot of these like reference architecture discussions and what does it mean to bolt down security in the pipeline, you know, all that right. stuff. Is like, what does shift left actually look like? Yeah, yeah. shift left security, I mean, all this stuff. But it was, again, like anything else, I guess my biggest problem is I get bored easy, right? And I was, you know, people <laughs> come up to me and want me to explain the, the whole like last 30 years of security in context of, DevOps, I'm like, yeah, like, I don't want to do that. Like identity, mm-hmm. yes, it's a thing, but like, it's not my thing, right? right. And, um, and what I found is I was starting to get a little bit uh, jaded on DevSecOps, not because of the name, but more of like, it was so, such a big discussion to have. And and I didn't want to be one of those people that had to go research and lane. Anyway, long story short, I ran into a couple of banks that were like discussing this new problem, which is, you know, how do you start uh, moving your, 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 if you think about what, what, it ha- why do we do a lot of the risk? It's for audit, right? Like we, we want to sort of prove we have this governance risk compliance. We have this, uh, you know, this risk posture that's bounded with our legal. It's our business, like it's right. protection of the brand, all these things, right? Yeah. And then how do we, how do we evidence that? Well, the ultimate evidence is an audit, right? Right. But but then um, there's this like incredible gap between what like is in some like 500 column spreadsheet uh, bank, and I'm not joking. I've seen one. <laughs> no, I've seen it too. And, I've worked and, for those companies. Yeah. yeah and, and and what the auditors do, right? And I started calling this uh, security and compliance theater, right? And oh, it's and, total theater, absolutely. And it's, it's even worse. Where I'm talking pre cloud native. It was terrible. Yeah. Right? And, and and we'll talk about like how cloud native just like it, it just leaves the universe in terms of separation. But but these a couple of like really, really interesting people that I've gotten to know through sort of Gene Kim's tribe, um, you know, of uh, you know, people that we we work with DevOps Enterprise uh, mm-hmm. at the forum. And we'd have these conversations at these events about like how does this have to change about and it all comes down to this, right? When you do an audit, you're basically showing evidence, and those evidence can be just tightly called attestations. Yes. And so, the the most modern organizations, the way they they um, produce evidence is to what I call subjective attestation models, which means that you know basically you know this everybody knows this. You just haven't heard it in these like fancy mm-hmm. uh, terms, which is you create a change record. The change record describes some human description of how things are going to happen, which right off the bat, like if you have any understanding of complex systems and all that, right? Yeah, like you, like, you only... Wait a minute. I just landed from Mars and like, really? I don't know if that's going to work. Mm-hmm. And then that, that human telephone game continues. Somebody on our advisory board says, you know what? Can you give me two more sentences about that subjective novel of what the change is going to do they go back they do that and then somebody in operations who has to approve getting into production says you know what i want a really good backup plan and i need to know you know when does it look and all this discussion is a thousand miles away decoupled from any cloud native activity deployment strategy blue green i mean like all right so and, and like there are people that, you know, so both of us know that are industry leaders in the DevOps that work for financial organizations like this is terrible. We spend 30 days a year doing audits. Yeah. And, and sometimes worse. But, yeah. We have no continuing. 
it's always this sort of event based. So, you know, the next 30 days, everybody be prepared. Um, and it actually creates any patterns too, because people start hiding stuff on purpose. Exactly. Right. Like you stick things in the, in the drawer under in the corner. Yeah, kind of thing. You don't, you don't yeah. explain fully a new technology because ooh, don't tell them about that piece. Right. Because boy, right. that's too God, that reminds me of my story at Duke that I'll have to tell later, but yeah, go ahead. Keep going. And, and so, so the, uh, and so the, you know, the, the question then became like, Oh, yeah, this subjective evidence. And then the auditors come in you have 30 days and, you know, they want screen prints to prove things. And like, mm, really, that's yeah, what like doing they now. actually want like screenshots on paper kind of thing. It's, yeah, so it's backwards it's, to anything in tech. <laughs> and then and so and then the efficacy of these are just laughable. Right. Like I've had zero zero point zero. Like, yeah, zero point zero. No kidding. You know, I, I can tell you this great story about this large bank of these people are building Go to Amazon DynamoDB on, a, on an application that was going on, you know, iPhones that was crushing in revenue. And they were scared to death to bring the auditors in because they were just like, they knew there was no connection to the So, the, so when we can get back to that, but the, the point is there were really three things that were sort of hovering. One was audits are just a waste of time. Every it, it, it's a, it's a vicious cycle of like, I'm not going to tell you stuff because if I do, it creates more work for me. Mm -hmm. uh, the second is efficacy is like really in, in when we talk about cloud native stuff, 0.0. .0. And then, um, and then like, how do we get rid of the cab? You know, I mean, I, or how do we start having a, a better conversation about what is the point of a cab and what is the evidence? And if the evidence is Sue tells Jane and Jane tells Bob and Bob tells Mike of this like abstract, discussion of what really happens in a complex system. And so we we started mulling over this idea of what, what I've sort of coined as uh, um, objective attestation. So right. what if we could, like, what if it was very specific about the policy? Now we make the policy people like, okay, now can you really tell me what you want? And, um, oh, oh, you want, you know, like, I can't just hand you this 400 column spreadsheet. Oh, darn. No, no. Now I want to know exactly what you want. And I will automate that so that no human touches it, that all mm -hmm. the attestations happen during the pipeline. And, and I, you know, the first rule of the blockchain fight club is never call it blockchain. Right. But it's basically a form of a blockchain of immutable attestations that can be linked. So now you have that. And now the auditor walks in and you say, well, guess what? This is, you know, this is basically, you know, this is a technology that can't be broke. It's immutable. Um, next, no screen prints. And so the idea, and so we worked on a project last November. It was um, the, the participants were, no, I'm sorry, not in, last April, uh, 2019. It was Capital One, PNC Bank, um, Marriott, Nike, um, Sengu Gahai from, uh, from Microsoft, and Mike Nygaard from Sabre. Saber Group. And we put together this. It's a Creative Commons. It's out there. I'll point to it. We put a first crack at what a reference architecture could be. It looked like where it was sort of a clean room. No, no humans are creating the attestations. They're all digitally signed attestations. And I, I, mean, I, I love what we did there. And that paper's been out for about a year. And then so that's sort of one thing. And then one of the banks have taken it to a whole new level. They, they create policy as code and I, we can mm -hmm. show you some. So one, while we were working on a paper, we, we were having these dinner conversations and we were like, wouldn't it be cool if we got this to work where we could give policy people human readable constructs to drive this automated attestation engine. And so one of the banks that I work with actually went out and built this over the last year where now the policy people write YAML and that YAML becomes the driver for the attestations and they built an enforcement engine. So that's one thing. Wow, that's works. nice. <laughs> Isn't it awesome? And then the second is um, because of that, I got pulled into this large open network user group. Uh, they had seen the paper and now they went a little different route, which was um, what they call automated cloud governance, similar. But in this case, we were asking the cloud providers to create their evidence so that we could use in this, you know, um, object attestation. And I can talk a little more about 
but we, re- we finished the paper. It's going to be another Creative Commons. It should be out in a couple of weeks about cool. like an ask for um, for the cloud providers to for evidence for certain things they do that can secure our trust or a tenant's trust mm-hmm. of the thing. So the, the in, in, in general, I, I can go into more detail, but in general, what we're saying is we need to be able to know if they're making changes that they don't think are of consequence to the consumers, but in some ways they might change network routing, they may change a posture that gives adversaries the ability to attack. So it, it's, it's right. both of those things. Probably the most exciting stuff I've worked on in my whole career. Wow. Okay. So yeah, let's get off this intro slide. Let's get into it. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> so we, uh, this is the the Red Hat t- the team. I talked about the GTO guys. Mm. Um, you know, I, you know, the battlefield is interesting. I mean, uh, you know, I think um, you know if you look at, um, I, you know, I've taken a lot of stuff to some from Derek Weeks and other people. He's over at Sonatype. He does great presentations on the. Yeah. Attack. Yeah, I mean, this actually one is the struts too, that happened a couple of years ago, and just yeah, happened. I remember seeing this when it first came out, and I was just like, yeah, wow, like just, the the amount of time we had to potentially go right was very very minimal, but it was there. Yeah, no, the the data is like some of the reports that that you know Sonatype continues the software supply chain stuff is, um, you know, like only about three percent basically deal with a zero day within. Yep of the first day yeah three percent or post three months you know, like, like 60 per three percent of our industry three months three months for a zero day like yeah. a, not just a well, zero no, day but i mean the struts two was like a like a like a heart bleed right they like still, that was if you were using it you were done like I mean, yeah i mean the the struts two i think some of their data is like forty thousand organizations typically download that that vulnerable library mm-hmm. a year today still. right Still, yeah, they're still downloading it. You know, there's the node stuff. I mean, if you heard like the the oh, event the, oh, thing, or, like, yeah, the where they just pulled the plug a, yeah. a year early, uh-huh. become a committer with the sole goal of knowing that there was a Bitcoin operator that used this library. Yep. You know, just you know, waited waited out the time, got the permission, embedded some uh, malicious code into that library. You know, what I mean, it's just, yeah, like. You know, being in the Kubernetes community, I worry about stuff like this, right? Like I'm welcoming people in and you never know who you're bringing in. Well, and that's that's another dangerous fact. And the the whole configuration, you know, configuration in the cloud era or cloud native era is the new scary attack vector, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This commas or an extra stanza that somebody copied and pasted from Stack Overflow and like, it works, hey, you know, I don't know. Yeah, but it's wide open. You know, and like, oh, that other stuff just created incredible permissive opportunities for adversaries. I mean, that, mm-hmm. in fact, you know, the Equifax thing has been told so many times, but I love the, you know, the, again, I've got a lot of presentations on this. I won't overwrite it, but the, the Capital One is like incredibly interesting, right? They, they're all sort of the same. They're at least sort of, they're, they're almost like if you look at any, we talked about like the sort of aviation. If you look at it, the uh, forensic of aviation disasters, like it, they're, they're very systems thinking, complex, adaptive, um, you know, forensics, and and so if you look at Capital One, like Capital One, would be like, oh yeah, it was somebody who worked for Amazon, they had inside, it's baloney. Like, well, you know what it was? It was basically what they call a server side request forgery, and it was a team that basically had to work outside of the process for whatever reason, went out and grabbed their own open source WAF, didn't configure it properly, left the defaults. But get this, um, they um, so it, they left bypass on in the WAF. And this that was ad- doing no good. Well, worse than this. And then took sort of their last known sort of Amazon credential set. So they actually were working on a, a sort of authorized VPC and Eesh. instance. And yeah, it, like this is the perfect storm of every. It's right. like the Air France 447. The, um, everything had to go wrong. So basically, what ultimately happened was. Um, this adversary just probably pokes every, I know pokes every bank continuously mm-hmm. hit a time for a very short period where they were able to do, you know, you know, example.com or capital one.com your bypass URL equals the, um, Amazon metadata server. Wow. So they just service yeah. side, server side request forgery and in the metadata server is basically, Oh, okay. Well you say you're an instance that's authorized. 
Here, cool. let me tell you everything there is to know about the security credentials. Nice. And, and it, uh, yeah. I mean, that's how, and by the way, this is a common attack that happens because the metadata server has, has some, you know, has a lot of information that yeah, could be very so useful for anybody trying to exploit things. And, you know, yeah. one of the problems about sort of one of the, you know, sort of the, um, you know, the, uh, that the glass half full about Amazon is they did a lot of things to make automation the prime motivated right. for using it for all those days, yeah. which meant like metadata server was critical to be able to find out your IP address, right? You had mm -hmm. this disconnected call. Now I need to know stuff about you've given me a not uh, notification that the instance is ready. I mean, but the, the glass is half empty is that mm -hmm. like, these automation things, you know, if you, if you get this sort of, you know, um, Imit imitate somebody who's authorized. That's almost every one of the major breaches that happened where, you know, people get into like the NSA, where they got into top secret data on S3. They're always service side request forgeries. Um, anyway, um, so this is the DevOps automated governance. You know, I, I, I tried to slap some slides together. We're still, you know, working mostly off the papers, less presentation, but, um, you know, the idea of putting, you um, digitally signed attestations, no human you know, kind of clean room with the objectives of shorten order time, increase audit efficacy and uh, reduce cab activity. And this is the guide. It's out there actually under itrevolution.com, forum papers, it's creative commons. Um, it really, I, I, I was literally getting, you know, sort of goosebumps when we were working on this. We'd have, Sam Guggenheimer, who's over at you know Microsoft, he's like one of the, the guys who's been there forever, understands the all oh, the backbone of everything they do from the security. Um, and then you got you know uh, Dwayne Holmes from Marriott, you have the, the 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 first fellow at Capital One, and you have PNC, and they're all sitting at the whiteboard. Well, you know, the way we show evidence. Right. Like, like I'm like, oh my God, like mm -hmm. like I, I get to live this life to sit here and and, uh, and and so at the end, it was 75 attestations. No one company would do all 75. It was really an amalgamation right. of what Marriott did, what PNC did, what, and, uh, you know, and uh, really proud of the book, um, you know, and, and, you know, this, we built a model. Um, what we did is we had to figure out like, um, you know, it's been, I always tell people, this isn't like the, the hundred and one way to show you what the pipeline looks like. <laughs> that was not the goal here. The goal was we need to contextualize a discussion of how would you describe attestations in breaking into stages? Right. Like we need to be able to say like, this is the check boxes, right? Like this you know, is this the guide the rails that you live in. Yeah, and, and how do you contextualize uh, a, you know, a discussion about attestations that have to be, at least granular enough to be in defined in the different stages. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, you know, all these experts, you know, the hundreds of ways to describe pipelines in the DevOps, you know, slide, you know, arena, you know, slide deck arena. It took us a half a day out of a three day discussion to really get this right. Um, because it had to be work from like, how could we bound attestations? You know, you look at it and say, Oh, John, that seems pretty simple, but, like if you think about the people that are in a room, but we, 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 we got it to um, basically seven models and you notice dependency and artifact have their own cycle. Yep. But you know, you have your, your you know, you know, development, you build. And the other thing we realized is I, and we don't see a lot of sort of DevOps supply chains where they separate package. And if you think about it from an attestation model, that's really that's important. True. Yeah. Whether it's a bar file or a container image, right. There is this, uh, mechanism of packaging in, and, and we built the, um, you know, the, you know, the common actors, but really important what we call controls. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I think that this whole thing here, I thought is subjective, but I, I do want to get to this one thing. So this is the guide again. Um, did I, yeah, here's, this is something that's important. So capital one in 2017 wrote this interesting uh, article about called, you know, focusing on the DevOps pipeline. And it was a section in there where they called creating better pipelines. Okay. And, and this is, um, you know, cause capital one is a big part of genes forum and all that. And so, mm -hmm. you know, and so I, I got to meet some of the, I, I've been sort of asked not to mention names of capital one. Because sure. No, I totally understand. They're very sensitive about, you know, sort of, 
you know, the, the things that happened to him last year. So I'm being very, you know, respectful there, but these are public things here. So, right. um, and, and this was an interesting article because it said, you know, Hey, you know, everybody sort of knew capital one is a poster. In fact, it, it's sort of really sad that that breach ha- happened to one of the, probably the, the poster childs of FinTech. Oh, yeah. Cloud yeah, and cloud exactly. And it's, it's just that it, it is those complex, like all the things have to align in the worst way to happen. And it could happen to anybody. Right. But mm-hmm. you know, that breach, but anyway, the, you know, they, they wrote this um, thing about how they put gates in the pipeline. Right. And, and it really was um, designed around if you wanted to have auto deploy, right. You know, sort of, sort of DevOps authority, if you will, right, you had right. to show evidence as the service owners, the service developers, that you could create evidence of the originally, I think it was 16 things, Oof. right? That it came from source control. It was, um, you had branching strategies or like at um, least uh, optimum in terms of the bank's, you know, architectural design. You did static analysis, 80%. You can, you can go through vulnerability, all these things, right? And if you could show evidence of these things, then you were giving you know more privileges about auto deploying and stuff like that. But this started me thinking about well, if you're doing this anyway, why couldn't these be the actual evidence as opposed to the change record? Right. And that's actually why I, I sort of created this working group, which was you know let's you know let's take this sort of a gating or control point model or gates and. Let's build. Um, and the other thing that happened is around the time I started thinking about it, Google open sourced a project called Graphius. I vaguely was, remember that. Yeah. Open source project that originally got a lot of hype and then just disappeared because nobody really understood how to use it. Yeah. And I saw it as this is what they do for automated governance. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Like. They're giving us this beautiful secret of, and actually I found out the back history was, I'm not sure if this is perfectly correct, is um, the reason it was created was when they were creating the uh, registry, the container registry. Okay. Because that is a place they had to have a lot of audit ref- evidence, yep. right? Yep, yep, yep. You've got, you've got stuff. tags, you've got all your code right there. Everything's packaged up, ready to roll. So you better they have that stuff. That. So they open sourced that thing. And I was like, whoa, wait a minute. I think we have a great opportunity. And really that was the sort of the genesis of that original project, which was, you know, start thinking about his Graphius. And, and we found there were a lot of deficiencies in Graphius. I've been working with a couple of companies that have just really taken this a lot further. But, you know, as you can see, like, this is an example of, this is right out of the uh, Creative Commons uh, book that I just talked mm-hmm. about. Like, but at the source code repository stage, the controls would be peer review, unit test coverage, clean dependency, right? And we built everything in this sort of input output model. Right. Because that's how it has to be, right? Like, oh, yeah, it's a chain. Stage. Yeah. Build stage, you'd have, you know, build, source control, immutable build, you know, these are uh, unit test and linting. You, know, you have your input, output, output becomes the artifacts. And then, you know, again, I won't like, unless you want to stop me, but the, the also where we found a lot of sort of really cool discussions around how do you actually manage dependency managing artifact uh, repositories, right? Like there's a, mm-hmm. there's this like, especially when you're talking about high consequence, you know, uh, services, you know, you know, customer facing top 10 bank code, right? You know, the, you, the, uh, the things that you have to start thinking about is, you know, not, not just sort of, sort of you know, um, are, are you, is it a trusted, so is it a signed trusted source? Right. Um, you know, is it, what, is there license checking built in? Is, is the, what is the age of the artifact, right? Like having right. Uh, approved version, same thing with package stage, right? All that stuff. Again, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll just tell people you read the book, but, um, and, you know, artifact <laughs> stage, is it immutable, right? We get into it. What point should everything at this, at, at what stage should, everything be mandatorily immutable, right? And, uh, you know, you get your prod and, and, and then again, here's sort of, the, and the other thing we did, which is really cool is we, we, we tried to figure out like if there was going to be attestations, where would they come from? So we weren't right. trying to pick like one vendor over another, but we, we literally walked through uh, a matrix at sort of developer level you might get, um, you know, your clean dependencies from like a, you know, a, a check marks or black duck or Nexus, right. Or Sony cube or, 
and uh, you know, same thing mm -hmm. with the gold and uh, you know. Anyway, um, I'll, I'll I'll sort of run through these real quick, but um, because I do, and then and then, um, and then there was like after that, one of the banks went back and said, "Hey, by the way, you know that whole thing we did in the reference guide, like we need we need uh, Kafka around it." Oh, of course we do. Of course you do. Of course you need Kafka. <laughs> How could we not? Um, How could we not know? have a production operation without Kafka? <laughs> right, and, and you know, especially when you're talking about like attestation for auditors right I, I need secure i need to secure that right yeah. and uh and then you know and then there's like um one of the companies has gone a lot further and so what one of the things they're doing now not only have they gotten into policies code with yaml files and all this stuff um they've actually now you know one of the things you realize we never talked about enforcement in the paper right like if you're going to do this you got to do both right you got to have right. the access yeah, to yeah yeah evidence and you're going to like why not like have the and so we realized is you had to create sort of an enforcer model and what and then what's really cool why not use opa and, and rego right so they're, they're, yeah. they're using opa and right so all the stuff this is what's so cool the stuff that i had in my head i got sort of well, you know gene gives us this opportunity to go to portland every year and work on these papers i'm like i got a good idea you know i mm -hmm. called Mike EP. we actually like in three days, built this really cool guide. And then one of the banks was so energized by this, they extended it to YAML files, the policy people. And today they have, you know, that built in as the final gate is in, in, in driven by OPA, you know, in the, in Which is the, great. In, I mean, that's OPA open yeah, policy right. agent for everybody to, to, to like, it's a CNCF project. It is in some degree of heading towards graduation, right? Like it is a very trusted project. Yeah, no, I mean, my only point is I, 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 I'm not positive. You know, I am, I was scarred very early in my career with prologue, you know, Ooh. so, uh, but you know, I, and, and I, I know Rego is not exactly prologue, but you know, I, I just like, you know, maybe King for a day, I would have started with a more malleable language, but, but, it, but other than that, right. It, like you said, it's there, it's, everybody's got it. Everybody's using why fight it? Um, and, and what they've done is basically create a nice sort of, um, you know, translation and relation, coupled relationship between the, the YAML pack files, the policy as code files in mm -hmm. Rego. It, it's really beautiful. Um, and, uh, you know, you, so you have all that and, uh, you know, sort of decoupling policy. Uh, it was, um, this is sort of an example. It's a policy as code. Um, right. Like, but that's just YAML, right? Like, yeah. And uh, imagine uh, that just, you know, and I, I've got another project <laughs> that uh, we've used uh, a Gherkin model. This, this okay. is very similar, but uh, actually, so you kind of guess the bank because they, um, they've actually mm -hmm. built, um, they, they've got some of their stuff like Graphius. There was a lot of things about Graphius that really at first we were like, we were going to punt on we're like, okay, it was a good idea, but like nobody's really, thought about how could you use like the, the, the notion imagine that one of the attestations is taking the build log tarring it and then turning that into a you know a sha and putting that wow yeah Ooh, now wow. you have real real immutable yeah like right? meta immutable <laughs> right? like yeah so, graphius like didn't give us that and then um and then graphius doesn't really have uh you know a relational database or some really permanent store but mm. you know what they stuck with Graphius, and now they're they've uh, they've got like a, a Graphius MySQL, which is awesome. They've uh, they've modified their own version of Graphius to sort of make it work in this model, and they're basically trying to contribute. But I'd love to get Red Hat excited about Graphius. So you know, again, maybe 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 this thing. I mean, it's entirely possible somebody at Red Hat's already looking at it. I don't know. Could be. Could what happened was it came out. There was a whole everybody got all excited about it, and then they couldn't really figure out how to fit it into their work. Because that was mm -hmm. the problem with Graphius. It would like look great. And you used it. It had all these sort of really honestly architectural floors for like if you weren't Google, it didn't work. Mm -hmm. And uh, PNC stuck with it. And now they've got it where it actually works for a bank. And they have this Go Badge thing. This is really cool too. So one of the things that um, that I love about automated governance is that it's this once you get to for the first step, you get to see all the things you couldn't see until you got to that step. That's right. Like we had to have the attestation model to be able to say, oh, well, why can't we create re human readable? Why do we have to have policy people go to IT people to have IT people then create 
Like right. it's the old you know, office space, right? Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. Have that's you read the TPS report? Right uh, what exactly do you do here? That's exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then the other thing was that um, as they started thinking about um, how do you put all this together, you know, one of the things that like all the stuff is there, but like the they start thinking about like it's sort of, you know everybody's CMDB out in everywhere in the enterprise is just polluted, right? It's just mm. not. But you have yeah. you have this notion of like the service name or this mnemonic that describes this thing. But it, it's just if you go back to CMB, CMDB and you look at the configuration item, mm -hmm. the service owner, like like there's no possibility in the universe to reconcile that with cloud native activities. Right? No, um, like yeah, no. Like the fact that you can maintain an active configuration management database with pods just spinning up and down left yeah, and right yeah, yeah, no yeah, like, no way thousand changes you know i mean i don't mm -hmm. think everybody's like amazon but a thousand changes you know it's how you know deploys in an hour right or whatever right whatever. yeah like just keeping yeah, just keeping that under time. wraps and like having that as a valid database would require another like whole system just to keep that up and running almost the equivalent size of the existing system <laughs> exactly right. like, some of the, some of the things about legacy like sort of risk is like you, like even if you wanted to solve it it'd take a three-year uh you know all yeah. hands on deck you know yeah. summit to solve but but here's the thing though this is why i like that what we're finding is people who are implementing it we're actually solving some of these complex problems where you know the alternative would have been a three-year summit with everybody in the company trying mm -hmm. to fix it versus emergent properties. So like in this example, they they get this Go badge thing, which is, it's an open source project. So in Bitbucket, it, it sort of shows, but the, the, the componentry behind it is interesting in that basically they've actually, as part of the auto, DevOps automated governance, so every change has to be sort of a pneumatic of the service. It's gotta be the component definition and the version. And so now that when when you actually want to sort of create pack files or start this policy as code initiative, you have to define your component at that level. So they're actually reverse engineering a configuration management database because the pack file can't exist without that three level identification. Right. That three level identification now is the evidence in the attestation store. Um, and now they've been able to do a simple thing like developers can see at the, you know, this is sort of in um, Bitbucket, but could have been any other tool, um, continuous evidence of their risk and compliance posture. Um, and then, then you get into, if you have that, this notion of audit and replay. So now every change that happened, imagine order, not only order now can just look at digital evidence right with the backstore from you know say graphius and mysql right that's there in fact in the, in the at the end of the day they could just be hitting enter every day or every hour in a day mm -hmm. yeah. um but they can actually say i want to know a little more about this one and we know that because now we can tie that to sort of the the service mnemonic the um the component id and the um the, the 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 version right the change itself right like you you can even put the sha in there commit sha right? yeah like you could have the the git commit sha as now, like a now link. I, now I've actually solved one of the hardest problems between sort of service management and idle and cloud native which is how the heck do I get those to the work well okay mm -hmm. here we go like basically if an auditor walks in and says I want to see this one okay well I can just go right back to the attestation store. That stuff will take me right back to the history and get, um, and uh, you know, and and so um, you know that's all there, and and so now I have immutable evidence, both not only on the attestation, but I have immutable evidence back to the deployment process that we're just commonly using with you know GitHub, Git, whatever. Right. Um, it's all there, right? So in a sense that the policy that was the actual change that you made. The policy is code that was like um, the um, the abstracted definition for that delivery are now completely coupled and evidence. So the auditor can come in, look at the MySQL back um, 
you know, sort of uh, definition, this fine grain detail definition. And then if they need to ask any real detail questions beyond, hey, do you not trust the blockchain? Um, we could go right to the evidence history of that change, the commit. To the, right. You know, and, and it's it's right there. You just click the link, off you go. There's it, the change. It was approved by two reviewers, that kind of thing. Well, and, yeah. and those were all part of the, the, the PAC file that reforced. Like maybe one of the attestations is appearing on a pull request. Yeah. And, and in exactly. fact, there's even, they don't all have to be automated. Like the, you know, one of the problems that, that comes up a lot is, you know, pen testing. Like pen test is like, Oh yeah. You need to pen test this. Like, okay, mm -hmm. great. Well, uh, give me a time window. What do you mean time window? We're the right. Like, or what do you, you want to prepare your systems to do what exactly? Yeah. And like, we don't <laughs> have the sense of a window anymore. Right. Like, and that's right. another problem. Like if you look at the change records, right. From the audit perspective, it's like, you know, who, you know, who authorized the change? Well, it's, Whoever is in the service owner and the CMDB. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I had one client where the CI for all activity on Amazon Cloud was the account. So that means from everything that they did from an audit perspective, by the book from service management, which was this change happened. I had DynamoDB. I did this. I did what? I, you know, I created S3, but whatever. Yeah. But if the auditor came back, they went to, the CI, and there was one CI, which was the account. It was actually four. They had four accounts. This is like a top five bank, right? The It wasn't PNC, by the way. Um, right. Top five bank. And so the auditors would literally, and I confirmed this, they would literally look at any of the activity on Amazon. They would basically say, okay, where's the, who's who's the change owner, the service owner? Wow. And the service owner would be somebody who actually set up the credit card or the, the, the well, that wouldn't be credit card at that top side bank, but the right, right, invoicing right. Um, you know, supply chain structure for working with Amazon, who has nothing to do with anything. Um, right. And then the second criteria for the first order is the service owner, which is like somebody who's either dead or has nothing to do with IT. And then the second is the, t the change window. Mm -hmm. well, the, well, there's no change window. It's like, it, it's now, it's yesterday. It's like in three mm -hmm. minutes from now, um, you know, but one of the things about um, pen testing then is you say, okay, well, this is real easy. You do your pen testing whenever you want. And here's your attestation model. And if your goal is to make sure that every once a month there's a pen test against this, we just throw that in as an attestation. It shows up in the continuous compliance review. Again, there's all these like really, you know, you find all these like uh, opportunities, you know, once you drive down this path. Anyway, that's, um, <laughs> we might have used up the whole hour on that one and, and have to come back for cloud automated governance. Uh, we got a little bit of time, I guess. Yeah, we got a smidgen of time. Yeah, come on. All right, we, so that we, was, you, and you can always come back, John. You're always welcome. Hey, you, you know me; I love to. I'm, I'm a I'm a big old blowhard. I I love to talk, right? So, uh, <laughs> so the second project, which is really interesting, I told you that, like we, you know, we we created that DevOps automated governance guide. That's you know, if you need to ping me, Jay Willis at Red Hat, I'll get you pointed to. It's free, Creative Commons. Um, I'm, you know, we're actually starting another working group. Where we're going to just really focus on policy. The first one was really about our reference architecture. Now we're going to like, what have we learned? So imagine this. So you give all those things I just talked about. Could you then do error budgeting for policy? Oh, why not? You actually have all the mechanics to actually. Read. Right. Like you can say like this, you know, everything. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's like, there. Now you actually yeah. have the evidence to do something. So sort of like SLL, SLI sort of activity. All right. Yeah. So all that happened. And then um, I've been. Loosely working with the guy who runs ONUG, which is the Open Network User Group. It's these guys were really big in sort of defining the white papers for mm. SD1 and and uh, you know, SDN and all that. A really really powerful group. It's it's a user group, but it's like this monster monster group with like all the major banks of Wall Street, and you you know um, they're all on the board. Um, the guy who runs it, Nick Lives, gave me a call and said, "Hey, I, we, we've been looking at this paper. Would you like to sort of work with us?" I'm like, "Yeah." So the next yeah. thing you know, uh, in December of last year, we start this working group with FedEx, Cigna, Kaiser Permanente. I live a charm life, my friend. Yes, um, you do. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it's a lot of luck with a lot of hard work, right? But um, mm -hmm. the um, Cigna, Kaiser Permanente, and um, FedEx, uh, UTC, which is Raytheon, and um, B of A, and um, basically loosely Goldman Sachs, but the guy who ran all engineering. 
And so we, we sat down and we said, like, let's use this. And the first thing everybody wanted to do is focus right on cloud. I'm like, hey, I'm not, you know, that's fine. You know, we could build on this or. And so um, I, I sort of sat back. I was the chair, but, you know, the chair meant that I just make sure that we focus on stuff. Right. And not right. get off course. But uh, immediately they came up with like three um, really interesting industry problems with the cloud providers. And okay. uh, so we wrote, um, and, and this will be available in a couple of weeks. Actually, the Wall Street Journal is going to do an article on it. Um, but here's the three um, that we, in this paper, and again, I can get people sort of early looks at some of this stuff, but we were, at, we're asking, we, and, and one of the things was we weren't asking the cloud providers because that like, you know, like, yes, not, like naive us are going to tell Amazon and Google and, and Microsoft to, what to do, right? Mm. Uh, so I was very clear about we're not asking the cloud providers. We're asking the industry to see if they accept these questions. And then maybe the industry will go back to the cloud. And by the way, that is happening now. So, uh, and the three questions were this, uh, quite simply. First was, could we get all the providers to give us a normalized way, an attestation, maybe some event or a signature or a checksum that tells us the current status of their boot sequence? Don't want to know any of the IP behind the boot sequence. Right. Don't care Just about that. I want to know that when I'm looking at my sort of security posture, my trusted posture, my tenant from your provider, mm. that I have a known state and nobody, you know, electricity to hypervisor. I, I just want to, I just want to know that you've given me some identification, some checksum that I know what that state looks like. So if somebody tomorrow decides, to, oh, nobody would even care. I need to change some code in the boot sequence. Like, why should I even document it to the customers? Um, it's scale. Let me say that again. Yeah. Scale. That yeah. may change the security and trusted posture. Mm. Well, very simple. And, and all these requests are, and again, this is a big ask, but that's why I was very clear about we're not asking them. <laughs> we're, like, let's get a hundred, you know, fortune or global yeah. 1,000 yeah. them with trillions of buying power. Right. right? And so yeah, um, one person is not going to move. You know, even one group right? even like, of, of yeah. you know, FedEx, Cigna. You know, I mean, there's actually a trillion dollars worth of buying power right? just in, in the working paper. But right. the point is like big, you know, little B, big ask is, could you give us these three things? I'll describe the other two, but one is sort of an attestation that we're, that we understand what what your boot sequence looks like now. We'll know if it changes. Mm -hmm. big, the capital big ask is we want that in a normalized format from all the vendors, right? Okay. So we don't. Have yeah, to yeah, yeah. Well. Like, we yeah, like give me a standard here. That's right. And and again, we're being clear not to say standards too. The second right, but, is more yeah. interesting <laughs> is. Every cloud provider sees all our ingress, their the ingress requests to them, right, right um, from us, right, like the API, everything we do. Like so, from a tenant perspective, we know that Amazon has an entry point to see everything that we're requesting. Right. What if they could just expose that back to us through an event gateway? Mm -hmm. And again, here, big ass capital B, all three of them in a normalized format that isn't packets, but it isn't very specific to the, the actual, um, we, we create sort of a, and there's a lot of work to be done here, right? Like, we're yeah, absolutely. Working. I mean, it's not, this isn't trivial stuff, right? right like you're, right, you're right. talking about feeding all the events back to the customer. Yeah. It's now, but, but in a way that you can listen on it, because now think about what you can do. So what do people do today, right? You, most people don't do anything, but the advanced people have to scrape hundreds of logs just mm -hmm. from Amazon. Then they have to have a whole nother set of code. And when the log format changes, imagine we just get rid of all that and we just have, an egress event gateway or event process that we can sit on with something like Lambda, what can we do now? We can remember oh, yeah. those server-side request forgeries or um, if somebody oh, look at this attack that's coming at us right, right now. Somebody uh, is, yeah. somebody is, is become, you know, doing server-side request forgery and they're trying to add something. And then, um, you know, and you know, so that there's a lot of sort of to be, there's, done, but yeah. imagine yeah, there's a lot of potential there. <laughs> Well, but, but imagine all your infrastructure. So I, I've, I've actually, let me go sort of deeper here and show you this. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I, we worked on this uh, using Gherkin as su su pseudocode. So here, yeah. imagine that all the infrastructure. So in the second ask, which is give us this sort of gateway model, 
The third ask is we didn't really get to finish as much, which is the have all the cloud providers give a common security framework. They all have their own security frameworks. Exactly. Yeah. But, but the second one to me is the most interesting, which is, so imagine now you've got this advanced stage of, excuse me for saying this way, DevOps, <laughs> but mm -hmm. where, um, you know, you're using Ansible or Terraform and all these things, everything built is actually built by some automated um, tool. So right. now you can put meta labels and tags and all that stuff. Yes. And now in the, in this ingress egress model from the cloud provider, they expose back the labels and tags. Right. So now a simple, uh, so like, uh, again, I won't go into this gory detail, but it'll be in the paper. So a simple sort of gherkin can say, uh, I got you there, uh, adversary. You didn't get the memo. There's mm -hmm. a blank meta field here. Right. right. And, and going back to policies code, maybe the meta file is the, is the mnemonic, the um, component and the version. Yeah. Right. And, and, oh, there's no meta field here. I wonder what this is. Let me look at a whitelist for crypto miners. Oh, that's mm -hmm. a crypto miner. Or, or if we start seeing like, uh, you know, the ad average statistics of our requests, and I'm just going to make up numbers for is like, you know, a hundred requests an hour for this service. And now all of a sudden we saw a thousand requests. Right. Like, hello, but, something and, and broke. Say, <laughs> you know? that in logs, but good luck, pal. And, you know, make sure you have a full time person maintaining logs just for Amazon. Right. You know, not, and then another for Google. And, and so, the, the, and actually the second paper that we got so much good press out of the first one, um, the um, four companies have now sort of gone back to, Amazon, Google, and, uh, and, uh, and Microsoft. And I've actually said, you know, I'm trying to get somebody read. I told you about this, right? Like, mm. um, like passes should be certainly part of this electricity, the hypervisor, right? Like, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, so, um, that's where we're at. And, uh, look, you know, where it looks like there's a shot that the actual cloud providers might be involved in the next working paper of this. I mean, so, well, that would be that would be an amazing feat, and it would also be something very good for the industry overall to have a, a standard coming out of every cloud provider, right? Like that right there would be big, right? Like if everyone agreed that, yes, this is a standard for anything, I think that would be a win. But if it's a standard for something like this that is so crucial and so powerful and so needed, yeah. uh, but people don't realize it's needed because it is so big and nebulous, yeah, like and that is a huge win. And, you know, Chris, to tie it all the way back to the beginning, like when I was telling about sort of DevOps and I was getting a little jaded, you know, I, one of the things I came to the realization is like, how do I, how can I be effective here? And it like me becoming an expert on identity and all those things would be just a waste of everybody's time, including myself. Right. But when I found this, I'm like, you know what? This isn't the answer to everything security, right? No. Uh, but man, when we talk about cloud native and all the problems that we're having with cloud and all this stuff and all this sort of, you know, theater of how we're doing audits and the exposures that we have, you know, I, I talked to DJ Sleen, who used to be a top security guy at Aetna. And now he's, I think he works at Sonatype now. Yeah, he does. Yeah, yeah. This to him, he's like, this is this thing. Like once you see it, you get all these like, like um, secondary ideas. He said, yeah. John, you know what I would do if I had that? If everything was built from an attestation model, when I got pwned, I would just dump the attestation data store. And then I would look for, you know, instead of needle in the haystack, I'd be right. like, I'd, I inverted the uh, forensic. Because yeah, so I, it's just a red flag I, sitting there in front of you. Don't have somebody yeah. stuck in my system. It's like the label thing. Yeah. Let me find all the things that are here that have happened. Like, let's look at this particular event. Let's backtrace it. And, oh, my God, there are no attestations for this. Oh, how did that happen? Oh, mm -hmm. we got an old Jenkins running over here. You know, and, yeah, so. Yeah, you find things in your infrastructure very quickly. Fun stuff, my friend. Yes, it is, sir. I, and, again, I appreciate you joining. Uh, we're running up on the top of the hour. Uh, I will be back later today with you know, our good friend, Diane Muller from uh, – OpenShift Commons, and she will be uh, having a presentation on. It's a from um, Alban Kirkway. I can't say his name right, but from, he's from Kenfolk. He's going to be talking about eBPF superpowers, and that's here in an hour. So join us in an hour for talking about eBPF and unleashing that on your Kubernetes cluster for maximum power. So thank you again, John Willis, for uh, 
touching base with us. Uh, your your Twitter handle, your email, I've dropped all that into the Twitch chat. Uh, anything you want to say before we sign off here, buddy? No, it's cool. I mean, if this stuff gets you excited, we're starting another. I'm starting two more working groups. These are all Creative Commons, open people that want to come in and share ideas. I mean, it's just beautiful to see multiple banks in there. This this stuff never happened ten years ago. No. Multiple banks sitting in the room and sharing because this is not your competitive advantage. This is table stakes. And right, stuff. like this. This is how you keep your operation running. So, so it's yeah. Jay Will said, uh, you know, at RedHat.com, you know, yeah. Ha- have a shout out. Thank you again, John. Appreciate it. And uh, see you all soon. All right.